This episode of The Y Files is brought to you by Aura. Like the Hubble before it, the James Webb Telescope has given us images of deep space that challenge our view of the universe and our place in it. Every day we discover new galaxies, stars, and planets. Some of these discoveries can even exceed our own imaginations. But we spend so much time exploring the heavens that it's easy to forget about the mysteries right here at home. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. Arthur C. Clarke famously said, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it clearly is ocean. As of 2023, less than 25% of the sea floor has been mapped. Less than 10% of the ocean has been explored. In that tiny amount of exploration, we found things that defy logic and challenge history. Sunken cities, ancient monuments, and objects that look like they're from another world. The more we explore, the more we learn, we know nothing about what lies beneath the waves. More people have walked on the moon than have been to the deepest parts of the ocean. So with all due respect to space, the real final frontier is the sea. Can I help you? Camp with the, uh, the Goldfish Hall of Fame. Uh, I need some information on a... Hang on, let me check here. Uh, Mr. Hecklefish Moriarty. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Vandekamp. Oh, Carlotta, please. Well, I'm sorry, Carlotta, but we don't give out employees' personal information. Employee? I was under the impression that Mr. Moriarty was more like a peer or a family member. Well, whatever your impression, we don't give out personal information. Crap. I mean, uh, thank you and have a wonderful day. Oh, I thank goodness I've reached you, human. I mean, person I never met before. I'm a Dr. Alfred Farthington III. I need to reach a, a Hagelfish Moriarty immediately. I'm afraid there's been a terrible accident. Really? What happened? I, uh, I, I milk a truck careened into his dear camel, Gertie. It means lost control. I know what it means, Mr. Farthington. Dr. Farthington. Then you know how important it is for me to reach Mr. Moriarty immediately. Please give me his name, address, and the email. Well, Gertie's fine. I'm looking at the cameras right now, and she's with her mother trying on my wife's shoes. I told her to cover the cameras before Why the- are you calling me pretending to be someone else? You knew it was me? Yes, I knew it was you, Dr. Carlotta Von Whatever. Crap. I knew I should have used my Starsky wig. Are you sure that wig wasn't Hutch? It's Starsky. What do you want? Yeah, fine. This morning I was Googling myself and my personal information is all over the internet. We've clearly got a security leak. You're the only one who knows all this stuff, so you must have spilled the beans. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What makes you think I'm the security leak? Well, I already waterboarded the beavers, but they didn't seem to mind it. Beavers live in water, you know. I didn't call you for your beaver expertise. I gotta find our security leak. There is a traitor in our midst. Hang on. Didn't you order high heels for Gertie online? Well, yeah, but the guy on the phone told me they don't share personal information. Look, just sign up for Aura. Aura? Oh, is that today's sponsor? Why, yes. It is. Aura can identify data brokers selling your info to spammers and robocallers. And Aura can submit opt-out requests on your behalf. And Aura does a lot more than protect you from data brokers. You can set up antivirus, VPN, parental controls, password management, and identity theft insurance. All from one easy app at one affordable price. Uh, well, that sounds good, but I'm a little busy helping Gertie and her mother try on all these shoes. Oy vey, I've never seen so many camel toes in one place. Well, you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to Aura.com slash Y-Files to start your two-week free trial, or just click the link in the description. Aura.com slash Y-Files, got it. I'll do it in just a minute. Today, Gertie wants to role-play a fairy tale. Oh, boy. Yeah, we're doing Cinder the Camel and the Handsome Fish. I already got the evil stepmother. Uh, take it easy, Marge. Just a game. Hey, does your wife have anything in a size 52? She doesn't. Crap, fine. Change your plans, honey. Uh, today we'll play Goldie Camel and the Three Beavers. Yeah, I'd rather you didn't... Look, that's enough chit-chat. I gotta go look up the recipe for porridge.
In June 2011, divers Peter Lindbergh and Dennis Orsberg were treasure hunting in the Gulf of Bothnia in the Baltic Sea. Peter had made a name for himself a few years earlier when he discovered a merchant ship that was sunk by German U-boats in World War I. The wreck was loaded with hundreds of bottles of rare cognac and brandy. The bottles were sold at auction for $20,000 each in today's money. That was enough of a nest egg for Peter to launch Ocean X, a deep sea exploration company, professional treasure hunters. Peter and Dennis knew the ocean floor beneath the busy shipping lanes of the Baltic were loaded with prizes. To this day, two or three dozen ships go missing every year. Many of those disappear in the Baltic. They were on a routine survey mission when their sonar got a hit. Everyone on the ship gathered around the machine to see what they discovered. The sonar slowly started to paint a picture. They couldn't tell what it was. A merchant ship? A submarine? Was it anything of value? When the image finally finished processing, it revealed a circular object that didn't look natural. It looked man-made. Well, maybe not man-made. It looked like a UFO. Oh, it looks like the uh, aluminum falcon. Millennium falcon. What'd I say? It was 200 feet wide and was lying at the end of a channel. Whatever this object was, it looked like it had hit the water and slid hundreds of feet across the sea floor. The object appeared to have a hull with chambers and sections with straight lines and right angles. Peter and Dennis gave the crew orders. Don't say anything about the object until they figure out what it is. Snitches get stitches. Well, they were just trying to protect the site. They didn't snitches want- Snitches get stitches. Fine. Rules of the street, rules of the sea. Anyway, they studied the image for weeks and were stumped. Finally, they decided to go public. The image went viral and landed in every newspaper and every broadcast in the world. Buckle up, Star Wars nerds. You're gonna like this one. What can only be described as the wreckage of a crashed spaceship. The genie was out of the bottle. There was no going back. They came across something unusual. Now everyone on Earth knew something mysterious was happening at the bottom of the Baltic. The hope was all that media coverage would help finance a return expedition to the site. If they could get back there, they'd dive to the object. They'd map the entire area in 3D. So the team started pitching investors and sponsors. Sponsors wanted to know, is this an alien craft? We don't know. Is it a natural formation? We don't know. Maybe it's proof of the lost city of Atlantis. Well. It's not Atlantis. No, why not? Well, because in 1968, Atlantis was already found. <laughs> in June 1938, Edgar Casey lay back on his couch and closed his eyes. After a few minutes of deep breathing, he started mumbling, then forming full sentences. He was in a trance. Edgar Casey was called the sleeping prophet because this was his process. He went into a deep state of relaxation like sleep and had visions of the past, present, and future. Casey gave thousands of readings where he predicted future events, and many of these came true. He predicted the stock market crash of 1929. He predicted the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He saw the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler. He predicted laser technology before anyone knew what that was. During this particular reading in 1938, Casey was interested in the ocean, specifically the lost city of Atlantis. Atlantis was made famous by Plato, who described the island nation in his works Timaeus and Critias. Plato described Atlantis as a powerful island nation with advanced technology. Then there was a cataclysm. Volcanoes, tsunamis, and a global flood destroyed Atlantis. It's been lying at the bottom of the ocean somewhere ever since. Officially, the story of Atlantis is considered an allegory, Plato's warning about the hubris of powerful nations. However, many people believe that Atlantis was a real place. Plato said he heard the story from his grandfather, who had heard it from the Athenian statesman Solon. Solon learned of Atlantis from an Egyptian priest who said Atlantis was destroyed 9,000 years before. That timeline lines up nicely with the global flood at the end of the Younger Dryas about 13,000 years ago. During Edgar Cayce's psychic reading, he confirmed that Atlantis was a real place. He said it was a large island nation in the Bahamas. He predicted that evidence of Atlantis would be found there. Specifically, 
He said evidence of Atlantis would be found in the area of Bimini in the Bahamas in 1968. 30 years later, in 1968, divers were exploring the area of Bimini when they saw something on the ocean floor that stood out from the surrounding landscape. It was a series of monoliths, giant stone blocks arranged in a line. Each block was a rectangular piece of limestone about 13 feet long, three feet high, and nine feet across, and each weighing several tons. The line of stones looked like a wall, or more like a road. Bimini Road extends for a half a mile. During the last ice age, the Earth's sea level was 300 feet lower. The islands of the Bahamas were one very large island, and Bimini Road would have run right through the middle of it. If you look at ancient maps like the Piri Reis map, you can see the Bahamas not depicted as a bunch of small islands. It's shown as a single large island, and running right through the middle, something that looks just like Bimini Road. Bimini Road has spawned all kinds of theories, especially since it's connected to an Edgar Cayce prediction that came true. Some say this was Atlantis, and Bimini Road is a remnant of the city's ancient harbor. This also shows that Atlanteans had advanced construction technology, just like Plato said. Other psychics say Bimini Road emits an unusual energy that produces visions and healing powers. I can't confirm that, but Edgar Cayce did. Ufologists think Bimini Road might have been a landing zone for spacecraft, or possibly a portal to a different dimension. This portal, they say, still opens and closes on a regular basis. In 1997, deep sea engineer Joseph Mason was diving Bimini when he saw a large square door open on the side of a stone block. The door led to an underground passage, but his compass started failing and the corridor disappeared. There've been strange electromagnetic readings above Bimini, sometimes causing instruments to go crazy. Is this evidence of portals or maybe something else? Remember, Bimini Road is in the Bermuda Triangle. In the 1970s, divers claimed to have seen more stones aligned into more roads, but those structures have since vanished. There's still no consensus about what Bimini Road is. If it's a natural formation, it's unlike anything ever discovered. But while skeptics and believers debated Bimini Road, the Ocean X team was out raising money trying to finance another trip to the UFO, the Baltic Sea Anomaly. It took a year, but they raised the money. So now it's time we go back to the Baltic. It took a year of pitching investors and sponsors, but the OceanX team finally had enough money for another expedition. Deep sea diving is expensive. At that time, it cost about 20,000 euros a day. They had 120,000 in total, that means they'd have less than a week to find the vessel. And they're already off to a rough start. A storm forced the ship to find shelter in the surrounding islands. Waiting out a storm is throwing money away, money they can't afford to lose. The following morning, their luck turns, and they've got clear skies and gentle seas. They begin scanning the area, looking for the craft. But they have to be careful. They're running radio silent, cell phones off, no connection to the outside world. The media frenzy created a lot of interest in the Baltic Sea Anomaly, but it was in international waters, which means anybody can take a shot at it. They had to be careful and avoid being tracked. Snitches get- I got it. Snitches. After ducking a Navy ship, they dropped the fish in the water. This is side-scanning sonar. It paints a two-dimensional image of the ocean floor. They also use a multi-beam echo sounder, this emits sound waves that create a three-dimensional image of the seabed. But then they hit another snag. They lost their sonar. Something was interfering with the equipment. Yeah, UFO jamming their stuff. That's a theory. They dropped an ROV in the water to try and track their gear. An ROV is a remotely operated underwater vehicle. Basically, it's a small submarine with a camera and a grabbing arm. Somehow, they find the sonar cable and they repair it. But this costs them a lot of time and morale is low. 48 hours later, they find the object. It's 300 feet down. That's deep and dangerous. So the ROV goes first, and they get the first close-up images of the anomaly. They see straight edges and what looks like concrete Sonar shows a perfectly round hole about 10 feet wide, and it's surrounded by a square frame. 
Nature doesn't produce perfect geometry like this. They're excited to get down there and see the object with their own eyes. But they're getting strange temperature readings. The water is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but the water right above the vessel is below freezing. Well, how is that possible? Well, they don't know. Then a fog rolls in. This makes deep diving very dangerous. They get the feeling that something wants to keep them away. Still, they decide to dive. After descending 300 feet down, they arrive at the object. It feels like concrete. They touch it and the material turns black. They want to get in a few more dives, but are out of time and money. Diving 300 feet means you need to take about 90 minutes to return to the surface. You have to ascend slowly to give your body time to readjust to the pressure. Return to the surface too fast and you can rupture a lung or worse. They have to turn back and they have another problem. Their 3D scan is incomplete and there's nothing they can do about it. Oh no. But they brought hammers and chisels on their dive. They managed to chip off pieces of the object. So they return to port and send the samples to a lab, hoping someone can tell them what the hell is this thing? When Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic in search of a new route to India, he found something else. And it wasn't the New World. Well, he did find that, but he found something else first. Like every good captain, Columbus kept a journal of the entire voyage. His full journal is available and it's worth reading. But there's one specific entry that stands out. 1492, October 11th, 10th p.m. I and Pedro Gutierrez, while on the deck of the Santa Maria, observed a light glimmering at a great distance. It vanished and reappeared several times during the night, moving up and down in sudden and passing gleams. It was sighted for four hours. You Columbus saw a UFO? He did. Well, technically he saw a USO, unidentified submerged object. Columbus made his first landfall the next day which means he had his UFO sighting while he was in the Bermuda Triangle. There have been sightings of underwater lights ever since. In 1644, the mayor of Boston saw two bright lights rise out of the water. In 1873, the Edelheid sailed over something in the South China Sea that lit up the ocean for over an hour. They said it looked like a Ferris wheel. In 1879, the HMS Vulture saw a large Ferris wheel spinning in the ocean. In 1880, commander of the SS Shah Jahan described a massive Ferris wheel under a calm sea near India's coast. Later that year, another ship with the British India Company saw the same object. They said it was 300 yards long. Those are just a few of the many reports of this object. There are reports of the same Ferris wheel type craft that span 200 years. Whatever objects are in our oceans, they've been here for a very, very long time. Since the early 1900s, professional sailors... Yeah, you mean semen? Yes. Say it. No. <laughs> Since the early 1900s, professional sailors and Navy men have seen lights in the water, and in some cases, craft emerge from the ocean. AWTEC is the Atlantic Undersea Test and Evaluation Center. This is a highly secret Navy facility located within the Bermuda Triangle. It opened in 1967, and it's in a remote location in the Bahamas near very deep water. At Autech, the Navy tests all kinds of equipment, including advanced weapons. It's been called the Navy's Area 51. Former employees of Autech base have reported mile-wide craft silently emerging from the sea. They create no sound. They make no waves or splash when going in or out of the water. 31 knots sustained wind, top side, gust 40 to 90. Oh, splash, splash, splash. Mark bearing a range. The USOs are strange enough, but the fact that they don't disturb the water is mind boggling. No scientist has come up with an explanation for this. One researcher said that there's a force field around the craft that's a vacuum which is why there's no wind or water resistance. In front of the machine, they open vacuum, vacuum space. This is why they need this tunnel. This is why they are never wet. Now, I don't think that works. A vacuum flying through the clouds or into water would still disrupt it. 
The only thing that makes sense to me, which makes no sense at all, is that UAPs are somehow interdimensional. I don't know what that is. That is some weird shit. So they exist in our universe, but they can pass through solid objects as if their physical matter is out of phase with ours. But we do allegedly have recovered craft. These are objects we can touch. So maybe this phase shift only happens when the engines are running. Or maybe anti-gravity technology makes a craft impervious to air and water friction. I really don't know. But there are more and more videos out there of UFOs shooting into and out of the water without disturbing a drop. This is clearly an important piece of their technology. If what we are witnessing is a true transmedium vehicle, a vehicle that can penetrate that barrier between air and sea or, or air and space without destruction, then we're looking at a propulsion system that is so far advanced, it's beyond next generation technology. So we're probably looking at, and what it is theorized is we're looking at, is a gravitational propulsion system, a non-reactionary propulsion system. In the late 1980s, Gulf Breeze, Florida, not far from the secret Navy facility, made global headlines. Local resident Ed Walters photographed a glowing acorn-shaped craft hovering above his neighborhood. His images triggered a wave of UFO sightings in the area, with hundreds of witnesses reporting similar encounters. Skeptics accused Walters of hoaxing the photos via double exposure, but analysis showed no sign of manipulation, only an ominous, unidentified object. Walter's photos are still some of the most compelling I've ever seen. This thing is real. It can't be no balloon. No balloon, man. No balloon. That is real. That's a real thing, dude. That is the real thing. Where the hell did it go? Gone, man. Gone. The Earth is covered by so much water and so much of it is unexplored that it seems obvious that aliens or whoever is controlling these craft would use the ocean as a way to stay hidden. In fact, there's a researcher who says there's a whole network of tunnels running under the ocean floor. These tunnels connect to large alien bases and the locations of those bases are not gonna surprise you. Cuban ufologist Maximilian de Lafayette is a leading proponent of the undersea alien tunnels theory. He gets his information from sources in the military and NASA. He claims there's a vast network of tunnels beneath the seabed. UAPs use these to move quickly from one part of the earth to the other. Within this tunnel network are hubs which contain large bases, 12 bases to be exact, and they're all over the world, South America, Russia, Japan, and there are bases in places you'd expect. like several in the Bermuda Triangle. There's a base in the Baltic Sea. Near the Aluminum Falcon. Yes, there. And there's a major base in Alaska. Mount M Hayes. Yes, under Mount Hayes. Remember we covered Joseph McMonagle in the episode about Project 8200? That was the secret CIA program that used psychic spies to remote view locations around the world. Joe and other psychics saw alien bases in Mount Hayes and other mountains. They also saw a lot of alien activity underwater. Joe specifically said that USOs were very busy around the U.S. Navy's base in the Bahamas. I remote viewed for every major intelligence agency in America. I did see some USOs that were operating within the vicinity of Autech. After researching this topic, it's obvious we need a full episode on alien underwater bases. So if you want to see that, let me know. There's so much more to cover. All right, last thing on this. A few months ago on the After Files, I covered a fascinating 4chan post. 4chan. I know, I know, 4chan is 4chan. But this person who claimed to be a former contractor for the Department of Defense was very believable. He says there's a large alien base underwater in the Bermuda Triangle. The reason planes and boats disappear is because they get too close to the base. In fact, he says the Navy knows where this base is and they specifically avoid it. The alien base can move. The Navy sees them move and they set up a new no-go zone. He said that one plane strayed too close and disintegrated into dust. But here are the bullet points. The US military believes the base has been there for a long time. At first they thought a few hundred years, but now they believe the base goes back to at least 4,000 BC. It might even be older, 
though he says there's an internal debate on this. So what the hell is it? Well, the base is a huge construction facility used to develop and deploy UFOs. They're here for research and resources. The military believes the base is operated by some kind of AI, not necessarily a sentient being or group of beings. The aliens, or whoever's in charge of the base, they don't really care about humans. The only time they'll get involved is if we start messing around with nuclear weapons. And we've seen UFOs appear on film of nuclear tests in the past. There's even that story of something shutting down a US nuclear missile facility. Here's how the base works. It decides it wants to survey some area of the Earth. Then, using raw materials within the base, a craft is constructed specifically for that purpose. The craft is built around whatever equipment is needed. If the base is going on a survey mission, it creates the necessary scanning gear. That package is then wrapped in a vehicle. The vehicle is deployed from the ocean. It goes on its mission, it gathers data, then the craft returns to the base, and the whole thing is broken back down again into raw materials. It's nice they recycle. Well, it's their planet. Uh, so no aliens? Just uh, spaceships that uh, don't go to space? Nope, there are aliens. Yes, fin bump. No, thank you. Come on, fin bump for aliens. There you go. And the ships do go to space, but rarely. They're here for Earth and a little bit of the moon. Again, different episode. Anyway, this whistleblower claims that the aliens are the greys, and they're not fully sentient. The government believes their drones are possibly even clones. They're grown as needed for mission support, just like the UFOs are built to be mission specific. Now that I think of it, we could do a whole episode just on this post. YouTube won't let me link to 4chan. Smart. But let me know if you want to see a full episode on all the details. He has a lot more to say. He talks about the materials they use to build, the power sources, different technologies that we've reverse engineered, lots of stuff. A lot of what he says is corroborated by other whistleblowers like Bob Lazar and even David Grush. Now, it could all be a hoax, but hoax or not, it's a really fun read. And speaking of hoaxes, we have to finish our story about the Baltic Sea anomaly. Oh no. Peter and Dennis from Ocean X brought up samples of the Baltic Sea Anomaly and sent them to a lab. It was just rock, no metals detected at all, so that rules out an alien ship. The rock was found to be volcanic, which is strange. There isn't volcanic activity in the area. The theory then changed from UFO to underground structure, maybe a temple or a building. There are features on the anomaly that do look man-made or unnatural, but the closer you look, the more it looks like nothing more than a weird rock. Now, on the internet, there are lots of fun photos and images and even video of the Baltic Sea Anomaly, but none of them are real. The only actual image is that first sonar image taken in 2011. Sonar expert Hanumat Singh weighed in and said that the image isn't great. If you look carefully, you can see a reflection of the circular formation on the right side of the image. Since side scan sonar is taken with two instruments that bounce acoustic waves in opposite directions from the boat, a feature on one side shouldn't affect the image on the other side. He says the reflections are caused by electrical crosstalk. This means the sonar wasn't wired properly. Singh calls this strike one, and he has more to say. The black horizontal lines going through the image show that sonar signals are dropping out. That is, the instruments aren't detecting them, further calling the measurements into question. A clean, properly wired sonar wouldn't have those lines. We'd have a clean image. That's not the case with the Baltic Sea Anomaly. Singh calls this strike two. Finally, the edges of the image, just beyond the circular formation, are gray, meaning the sonar couldn't tell what was there. That shows the sonar isn't calibrated well enough to trust. That's strike three. The Ocean X team has been attacked and accused of hoaxing the whole thing. It was suspicious that when they went back the following year, they had equipment failure. Remember, they lost their sonar, and their 3D imaging was incomplete. Skeptics say this is too convenient, and people started calling it a scam. Now, Peter and Dennis spent a lot of time trying to raise money to go back, but they couldn't find the support. They blame the media for this. I agree. Blame the media. You don't even know what the media did. Oh, uh, let me guess. They jumped to conclusions without checking the facts? Okay, so you do know what the media did. Not my first rodeo, chief. 
After it was discovered that there was no metal, the media went hard on the Ocean X team. They called it a scam. Every time the team pitched investors, they were turned down. Nobody wanted to sponsor a potential hoax. Peter has distanced himself from the whole thing. He was tired of being called a con man. Now, in defense of the guys, they did go back to the site a few years ago with an ROV, and there's more footage of it. They claim they found possible writing or hieroglyphics on the side of one of the stones. And it could be, it's too hard to tell. As of 2020, experts believe the Baltic Sea anomaly is a piece of volcanic rock that was pushed in place by a glacier. That's why there's a channel behind it. Now, everyone admits it does look strange. It doesn't look natural. But until a serious, well-funded dive team goes down there and spends a lot of time studying it, we'll never know. Dennis posted on his YouTube page just a few weeks ago that he's had a rough year with this and other projects. He had a Russian shipwreck dive scheduled, but the war derailed his plans. And he still can't find financial support to go back to the Baltic Sea object. He thinks this is a shame and a waste, and I don't disagree. Unfortunately, investors want a return on their money. The Baltic Sea anomaly doesn't have a financial upside. Yeah, unless it's one of the greatest discoveries in history. Well, it may be a great discovery, but there's no profit in it, so there's no support. That's why nobody's gone back to the moon. No profit. Nobody ever went to the moon. Look, I don't want to get it. Nobody ever went to the moon, and I'm not going to tell you again. Promise? Don't make me fin slap you. As for Bimini Road, the mainstream view is it's a natural formation. It's just beach rock that happened to arrange itself in that way. In a perfect line, half a mile long. Well, that's the mainstream view. Ah, the mainstream is full of sh Watch your mouth. But you're right. The mainstream is often wrong. The Bimini Road looks man-made to me. Unfortunately, there's no way to date the rock, so we don't know how long it's been down there. Whether it's connected to Atlantis or not, nobody knows. There are no other objects or structures in the area, at least none confirmed. Now, there is that sunken city off the coast of Cuba that could be thousands of years old. And if the sea level was 300 feet lower, that whole area could have held a huge civilization. But again, no solid evidence, only speculation. I love speculation. I know you do. It's a living. The last thing we covered are underwater bases and the USOs. No, 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 don't debunk those. I can't. Oh, thank goodness. We lose subscribers when you do that. Now, we can and should be skeptical about posts on 4chan and Reddit. They make for good reading, but that's not evidence. But we have plenty of statements from witnesses who've seen objects going in and out of the water. And by now, we've all seen footage of UFOs flying over and into the ocean. Now, there isn't a lot of physical evidence of actual underwater bases, but just a few months ago, an interesting image hit the news. It's an underwater scan near Catalina Island off the coast of California. Tim Gallaudet, a former admiral who is one of the Navy's top oceanography experts, says this scan is worth investigating. Now, this is an admiral, not just a sailor. Seaman. Stop it. The admiral saw the image and says there's no natural explanation for it, and it could be an entrance to an underwater or underground base. I think it's about time that we do disclose that we, we are in contact with non-human intelligence. That, that's what needs to be put out there in the public. Catalina has been a UFO hotspot for years. That's where the USS Nimitz was in 2004 when a pilot chased a UFO for miles. We've all seen this footage. The Admiral says there's a lack of scientific curiosity from the military when it comes to UFOs. And he's right. Congress just passed a defense bill that includes language that gives the American people full transparency and access to the government's information on UFOs. Now, you already knew this. The news called it the UAP Disclosure Bill. But did you know that the Pentagon stripped all the language regarding disclosure from the bill? Now, as always, they can remove anything regarding UFOs if the information is considered a matter of national security. So, uh, that could be anything. Anything. The Department of Defense can hide, cover up, redact, classify, or even destroy any evidence of UFOs they want, any time they want. No! Yep. Tim Burchett, a Republican congressman from Tennessee, wrote the disclosure amendment. He said, and I quote, we got ripped off. We got completely hosed. They stripped out every part. Burchett's a Republican. So it was Democrats that hosed us, right? Nope, it was Republicans. Oh, so Republicans are the problem, right? Nope, our Democrat Senate and Democrat President signed it. Uniparty. Uniparty. 
People ask me all the time about disclosure. Are we close? Are they finally going to tell us? And they hate it when I tell them, no, no, they're not. Congressman Burchett and Admiral Gallaudet are right. The Pentagon, the military intelligence complex, the shadow government, whatever you want to call it, they're not curious about UFOs. They're not curious about what they are. They're not curious about why they're here. They're not curious at all. I think the reason for this lack of curiosity is clear. Why be curious about something you already know? Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. You know Hecklefish. Yeah, what's kicking, sexy chicken? But but. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do him a favor, like, subscribe, comment, share. That stuff really makes his fins wiggle. Like most topics we cover here, today's was recommended by you. So if there's a story you'd like to see or learn more about, go to thewhyfiles.com slash tips. And remember, The Y Files is also a podcast. Twice a week, sometimes more, I post deep dives into the stories we cover here on the channel. I also post episodes that wouldn't be allowed on the channel. It's called the Y Files Operation Podcast, and it's available everywhere you get your podcasts. Now, if you want more Y Files in your life, because we all need that, check out our Discord. There are thousands of people on there 24 7, sometimes longer, and they're into the same weird stuff we are. It's a great community, it's a lot of fun, and it's free to join. Now, if you want to know what's going on with the channel, go to thewifiles.com slash cal. That's our production calendar. There you'll see our podcasts, our live streams, and what episodes are coming your way. And special thanks to our patron who make it all possible. Every episode of The Wife Files is dedicated to our Patreon members. Without you guys, there would be no channel. I don't deserve your support, but I am grateful for it. Now, if you'd like to support the channel, become a member on Patreon. For as little as three bucks a month, you get access to perks like the videos early with no commercials. You get access to merch only available to members. Plus, you get two private live streams every week just for you. My camera's on, your camera's on. We see each other's faces. Our mouth holes work together, mano a mano, official. It's intimate. Another great way to support the channel, which not as intimate, but it's still a great way to support, is grab something from the Wi-Fi store. Oh, 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 now it's time for me to plug this stuff. Grab a hang of a t-shirt or a fishable coffee mug and put a drink in there and have a delicious beverage while you're wearing a hoodie with my hecklefish face on it while you're squeezing one of these hecklefish squeezy animal fish toy, target fish toys, while you play the game of go hecklefish card game. <laughs> and that's going to do it. Until next time, be safe, be kind, and know that you are appreciated. A secret code inside the Bible said I was I love my UFOs and paranormal fun As well as music, so I'm singing it like I should But then another conspiracy theory becomes the truth, my friends And it never ends, no it never ends Stuck inside Mel's home with MK Ultra I'll be an only true aware Did Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing alone On a film set or were the shadow people there? The Roswell aliens just fought the smiling man I'm told and his name was Cold And I can't believe Secret City Underground 
Mysterious number stations, planets circle to Project Stargate and what the Dark Watchers found. We're in a simulation, don't you worry though. The Black Knight satellite is so I can't believe. 